This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. Thousands of listeners and a lot of the contractors I use and my readers use FreshBooks. If you've been thinking about turning your part-time side business into a full-time small business, or big business for that matter, you may be feeling some extra uncertainty these days, and that's obviously completely natural. There are a lot of questions that can come up. How do you create a professional appearance and experience? Who can help you with support? How do you manage the billing and all of that, but still focus on the primary work of your business and on growing your business? FreshBooks is an all-in-one invoicing and accounting solution. It does a lot more than that. That helps you take your business from part-time to full-time, and it only takes minutes to set up. They have one of the best sign-up flows in the business. I've seen very few better. They have been helping people turn their passions into small businesses for 15 years, and they can help you too. I've met the founders. I've looked at this product very closely. With automated invoicing, billable time, and expense tracking, and an intuitive dashboard that ties it all together, it's like having a full-time financial assistant with you every step of the way. You can create, customize, and send branded and professional looking invoices in about 30 seconds. You get paid up to twice as fast with fees as low as 1% using ACH payments on FreshBooks. It's a fast, easy, and secure way for clients to pay you for your work and pay you more quickly. One of the many things that sets FreshBooks apart is their award-winning Toronto-based customer service. A real person picks up fast and will help you until you are completely satisfied and have your questions answered. There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, but your ability to build a business that you're passionate about, that you're proud of, doesn't have to be one of those things. Business owners all over the world rate FreshBooks as the easiest accounting software to use. Try it out. Check it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash Tim. Just enter Tim Ferriss in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash Tim to check it out and try it for free for 30 days. One more time, freshbooks.com slash Tim. This episode is brought to you by All Form. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably heard me talk about Helix Sleep and their mattresses, which I've been using since 2017. I have two of them upstairs from where I'm sitting at this moment. And now Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called All Form, A L L F O R M, and they're making premium customizable sofas and chairs shipped right to your door at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. So I'm sitting in my living room right now, and it's entirely all-form furniture. I've got two chairs, I've got an ottoman, and I have an L-sectional couch, and I'll come back to that. You can pick your fabric. They're all spill, stain, and scratch resistant. The sofa color, the color of the legs, the sofa size, the shape to make sure it's perfect for you in your home. Also, all form arrives in just three to seven days and you can assemble it all yourself in a few minutes. No tools needed. I was quite astonished by how modular and easy these things fit together, kind of like Lego pieces. They've got armchairs, love seats, all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everyone. You can also start small and kind of build on top of it if you wanted to get a smaller couch and then build out on it, which is actually in a way what I did because I can turn my L sectional couch into a normal straight couch and then with a separate ottoman in a matter of about 60 seconds. It's pretty rad. So I mentioned I have all of these different things in this room. I use the natural leg finish, which is their lightest color, and I dig it. I mean, I've been using these things hours and hours and hours every single day. So I am using what I am sharing with you guys. And if getting a sofa without trying it in-store sounds risky, you don't need to worry. All form sofas are delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping, and you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. Your sofa frame also has a forever warranty that's literally forever. So check it out. Take a look. They've got all sorts of cool stuff to choose from. I was skeptical, and it actually worked. It worked much better than I could have imagined, and I'm very, very happy. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Tim. That's A-L-L-F-O-R-M dot com slash Tim. Allform is offering 20% off all orders to you, my dear listeners, at allform.com slash Tim. Make sure to use the code Tim at checkout. That's allform.com slash Tim and use code Tim at checkout. Optimal minimal. At this altitude, I can run flat out for a half mile before my hands start shaking. Can I ask you a personal question? Now would have seen an appropriate time. What if I did the opposite? I'm a cybernetic organism, living tissue over a metal endoskeleton. Hello. 
Hello, boys and girls, ladies and germs. This is Tim Ferriss. Welcome to another episode of The Tim Ferriss Show, where it is my job always to deconstruct world-class performers of all different types to tease out the habits, routines, favorite books, whatever, that you can test and apply in your own lives. My guest today, I'm very excited to have on, finally, Stephen Rinella, R-I-N-E-L-L-A. You can find him on Instagram, at Meat Eater, also at Stephen Rinella, Stephen with a V. He is the host of the Netflix original series, Meat Eater and the Meat Eater podcast. He's also the author of seven books dealing with wildlife conservation, hunting, fishing, and wild foods, including a forthcoming book, The Meat Eater Guide to Wilderness Skills and Survival, coming out December 1st, 2020. You can find all things Meat Eater on TheMeatEater.com, and you can also find Stephen on Facebook, at Stephen Ranella Meat Eater. Steve, so nice to have you on the show. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. That was a good delivery there, man. That was, <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> that was A-grade hosting. <laughs> well, you know, we, we met, I was trying to do the math on it, and I'm guessing, I want you to correct me if I'm wrong, but I want to say maybe uh, mid to late. 2011, and I was trying to do a trip down memory lane. It's almost 10 years since we first met, which is just bonkers. And I promised that if I screwed up the intro, I would not make you suffer through 20 retakes and that I would fix any flubs later. But it seems like lifetimes ago that we first met in the context of the four hour chef. And I thought perhaps a trip down memory lane. Uh, at least as I've been doing prep for this, there's been quite a bit of that. Could be fun for setting the stage because there's certainly going to be some listeners of this podcast who have hunted and there are going to be many, many who have not. And I wanted to read just a tiny little piece from the first chapter. I had someone on my team pull everywhere you appeared in The 4-Hour Chef and it was like a quarter of the book. So I only dug into a few pieces, but there's a chapter called The Anti-Hunter's First Hunt. The Anti-Hunter referring to me because I grew up on Long Island having very bad associations with the hunters who did a very poor job in my neighborhood and around my house where I grew up, but uh, you are the counterpoint. So I wanted to set the stage. I'm going to skip things a little bit, but the heading is 6 a.m. South Carolina, and then I'll skip down. Steve Rinella's tutelage and all things hunting was encyclopedic. My 6 a.m. brain struggled to absorb a motley assortment of miscellanea. Point. Deer are classified as crepuscular. In simple terms, they move mostly at dawn and at dusk. Point. Kiefer Sutherland was once swindled in a cattle rustling Ponzi scheme. I'd forgotten that one. Point. If Steve could only eat one meat for the rest of his life, let me know if this has changed. A monthly 50-pound allotment of any wild or domesticated animal, it would absolutely be elk, specifically cow elk or young bull elk. Point. The original version of The Joy of Cooking had instructions for how to fatten a trapped opossum with milk and cereals for 10 days before slaughtering and cooking it. Point. The neck of a male deer in mating mode, in other words, a ruddy buck, in quotation marks, can double in size, making it look like a linebacker. Point. Skinning a rabbit is easier than taking off your socks. Grab the scruff and peel, pulling down towards the head. Eating rabbit requires caution, though, as you can die from tularemia, an infectious disease named after Tulare County in California. Steve is as down to earth. This won't go too terribly long, so bear with me. Steve is as down to earth as you would hope any good hunter to be, but he didn't fit my stereotype. For instance, he applies physics terms to skinning and most relevant to my food quest, as he put it, quote, there are far better chefs out there than me. There are far better hunters out there, too, but there aren't many who can combine the two like I do. He is a master of turning the wild into, quote, ingredients people recognize. Now I'm going to need some French help. In 2004, he prepared a three-day, 45-course, so I'm going to let that sink in for people, a three-day, 45-course banquet from Escoffier's landmark 1903 classic. Is it Le, Le Guide Culinaire? How do you, I have no idea how to say that properly. I'll tell you what I do. I say The what Culinary do do? Guide. <laughs> the Culinary Guide. Nice. All right. And then the last, the last paragraph I'll read here is, by prepare, I mean that he foraged, killed, and otherwise procured every ingredient from the outdoors, then recreated the feast himself, which took more than a week. This experiment was chronicled in his first book. Now here's another French word, The Scavenger's Guide to Haute Cuisine, H-A-U-T-E. I've been well-trained right? in this one. And still, every time you do it, you'll get corrected. Haute. Haute. Okay. No, like, it, it's Scavenger's like Guide Haute. To Haute. Oat, oat. Oh, I see. Without the H. All right. Scavenger's Guide to Oat Cuisine. There you go. That, that, was great. that was great, man. That was better than I do. Thank you. You know, you know, I've been I've been working on my French on the side. He started trapping for income in rural Michigan when he was 10, now 38. That's of course changed. He writes for a living and his work is as likely to be seen in the New York Times as in field and stream. So I wanted to set the stage because I think a lot of people in their minds, as soon as I mention hunting or anything else, will have 
an image pop up. And I don't think that image matches you all that well, the, at least the kind of stereotypical image that will pop up for non-hunters. When I was younger, I think it would have matched me perfectly well, man. Mm, say um, more. So I grew up in Michigan, but across the lake, you know, not terribly far away, sat the state of Wisconsin. And my good friend Pat Durkin in Wisconsin had once said something along the lines of, you know, where he lived that if you weren't a deer hunter, you at least slept with one. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't a ton of, you know, there wasn't a ton of self-reflection at the time. And also raised up by a generation that hadn't been invited into and cultivated any kind of real conservation ethic. And there was a bit of a get what's yours while you can get it mentality mm -hmm. that I grew up on. But I, I don't want to derail you. I just, you know, I, I just get a little yeah. bit, maybe we'll touch on this later. I, no I, I, I often get you accused, can't derail me. I often get accused of being um, somehow different than hunters or different than normal hunters, or different than what you'd expect as a hunter. And man, like I feel like I'm a lot like the people that I spend a lot of time with. I'm a lot like a lot of the people that I spend a lot of time with. Let's dig into it. So, for instance, in an interview that I read and prepped for this, you self-described as a hunter conservationist, right? Mm -hmm. Hyphenated. And I want to talk about that. And I guess by introing you the way that I did, what I wanted to point out, and I'll just personalize this, is that you know, growing up, my exposure to hunters was very limited. It was limited to seeing wounded deer with like arrows like stuck in them on my property, mm -hmm. um, my parents' property, because people were A, trespassing, B, just not doing a very good job of hunting, understanding that you're not going to have perfect shots all the time, but they're like beer cans everywhere. And it just wasn't a positive association. Sure. Yeah. Now, in, in, in contrast, though, at least if we look at, I guess at the time, 38 year old Steve, who I went to South Carolina with for my first hunt, the experience and the explanation and the care and the attention to detail was something that I never would have associated with hunting growing up. I suppose all I'm trying to do is contrast those two things, which were largely an imaginary figure in my head based on a few bits of exposure as a kid and yeah, then my yeah. experience with you, which were very, very, very different. And that's not to say that most hunters are what I experienced as a kid and not what you are, but uh, let's dig into it. Like, why do you call yourself if you still do or identify as a hunter conservationist? Oh, I, I absolutely do. Even sitting where I'm at today. So, you know, you, you're reading from when you're 38, I'm 46, even sitting from where I am today. When I look back at what our relationship, when I say our, my families, the people I was around, what our relationship was with nature and the out of doors was very much based on a deep, deep love and appreciation for resources, for wild places, for nature. It was almost like we would have never have put these words to it, but it was a sacred thing, and it was almost like a sort of worship for animals in a worship of wild places. But the perspective on it, I didn't know the history of how things came to be the way they were. We had a lot of national forest around us. We were sort of on the southern terminus of the Manistee National Forest. I think now it's the Huron Manistee National Forest. It was combined with another national forest. We were sitting at the southern terminus of that national forest. I couldn't have told you the first thing about how that place came to be. What sacrifices were made in our history to have the abundant wildlife that we had? I couldn't have told you how bad things had gotten in this country in the late 1800s and early 1900s with regards to wildlife. If there was a sign on that national forest that said close to vehicular traffic, if it wasn't physically blocked, that would that sign wouldn't really mean much to us. If it looked like somebody else drove there, we would drive there as well. I, at times, when faced with like an abundant surplus of things, sold things for money that sold wild game for money, knowing you weren't really supposed to do that with some species that we would sell, but it was a thing that people around you did. You didn't really know that it was wrong. At the same time, we would see behaviors that we recognized as 
abhorrent, things that would probably blow away any negatives that you might have seen growing up. I've probably seen worse behaviors from hunters and anglers than you have. So I always lived with a, even if from my perspective right now, we had some poor behaviors, some ill thought behaviors, I always recognized the spectrum of bad behavior. And there were things that would happen around us that my father would be incensed about and would like dissociate with people who had extraordinarily bad behavior. And if you look at that sense of there being a spectrum of ethics or a spectrum of a conservation ethos throughout life with education and with like various epiphanies that come with just learning how to think and having exposure to books and ideas, scientists, biologists, ecologists, philosophers, whatever, it's become more fine-tuned. And I now have a very acute sense of what it takes to have wildlife in wild places. I have a good understanding of that now. I understand our history now. And that has led me to like an extraordinary amount of reflection over the years about what role a hunter or an angler should play when it comes to environmental stewardship and hunting. So I associate as a conservationist because I try to really put my money and actions where my mouth is on conservation, meaning clean air, clean water, lots of animals, lots of wildlife habitat. Those are things I stand for. And I see that that is a thing that's increasing among my kind. But it's a little tough for me to think of myself as somehow extraordinary because I see many, many people go down the same path that I did. A long exposure to this seems to lead in this direction for most people. For people who not only have no exposure to hunting themselves, but who have no real familiarity with how hunting works in the U.S. from an economic perspective, the ecosystem, not necessarily the natural ecosystem, but sort of the fiscal ecosystem. I was reading an article and you seem to comment on the decline in hunting and fishing license sales as worrisome. Could you expand on that or speak to that? I'd love to give people an idea. Oh, like of how, how funding works? How funding works. Yeah, exactly. I would love to. This is something that there's a catch 22 almost within this. But yeah, I'd love to talk about that. So I know you, you have a global audience. I'm going to run down how it works in the United States. I can claim subject matter expertise in the U.S. and I have a passing familiarity with other places, but I'm going to focus on the U.S. The U.S. has 50 states, right? So all 50 states have a state fish and game agency. And your state fish and game agencies are responsible for the stewardship of wildlife in your state. There are exceptions to this because migratory birds and some migratory fishes and things where an animal isn't going to live its entire life sort of in one in, in the confines of a particular state then you'll have federal oversight over what happens in a state like there's sort of a some federal guidelines about how a state might handle its na its wildlife resources there's other exceptions too when you get an endangered species act and, and things like that but generally you could say that the people in a state own the wildlife in that state so if you're sitting in New York and you see a, a, a deer, you, as a New Yorker, own that deer. That deer is managed for you by your state agency. So it doesn't matter what that deer is sitting in a cemetery. If it jumps a fence into a county park, if it jumps a fence onto a farm, if it jumps a fence into a national forest, that deer is the state's, meaning it's yours. These agencies manage wildlife in terms of access to it. Oftentimes states manage like boat launches and, and trailheads on state lands and things, but they also do disease work on wildlife. So they do re, you know, researching diseases, wildlife management, enforcement of wildlife laws. So if someone's poaching, it's a state issue and that all comes from your state fish and game agency. Some state fish and game agencies get no hard funding. When you pay your taxes in your state, in a lot of states, none of your general tax money goes to your state fish and game agency. The bulk of state fish and game agencies' finances come from the sale of licenses, tags, and stamps, hunting licenses, fishing licenses, permits, tags, all the stuff that goes with hunting and fishing. And another major funding source for state fish and game agencies is excise taxes on firearms, ammunition, 
very use specific sporting goods items, marine gas, fishing tackle, fishing line, these excise taxes, which can be like on guns and ammo, these excise taxes come in at around, you know, 11 or 12%. So when you go down and buy, even if some person that lives in New York city goes down and buy, and they have a concealed carry permit, say, and they go down and buy some ammo for a concealed carry permit, about 11 or 12% of the cost they pay on that ammo goes to fund wildlife. And that's how we pay for this whole system. There are complexities to it, but that's how we pay for it. A fear about declining hunting and angling numbers. You know, angling numbers, this is, since COVID, they're seeing a pretty strong uptick in fishing numbers with people. Like, I think people weren't able to go do what they would normally do. They're like, ah, oh, fuck it, I'll go fishing, you know? And, and <laughs> we're seeing a fair bit of that. Whether or not they'll be fishing in two years is not known. A fear about declining hunter numbers. And it, I'll tell you an interesting point. There, I think that there are about as many hunters right now as there were in the years following World War II. And they were low after World War II. Well, that was the peak in terms of per capita. Oh, that was the peak. All those dudes, this actually plays into my, I, I got to remember where I was at, but this actually plays into my own sort of genesis, right? Is my dad, my dad had me, he was old. My dad had, had me when he was 50. He fought in World War II. And when he came home from World War II, he, like just about every other guy that went off and fought in World War II, got into hunting and fishing. It was sort of the, that era, the late 40s, early 1950s, that was the birth of the modern American sportsman. People had money. They were buying cars. They were traveling around. There was this, we, we were fetishizing the great outdoors. And my dad was part of that generation. But I'm saying hunting participation was so high then. I don't know, like, I guess you could look up real quick what the U.S. population was in 1947, say, but, or 1950. But, you know, I think we've, quadrupled our population, but we had about as many hunters then as we have now. So participation rates decline. In many cases, numbers of people who hunt decline. And a long-term fear, besides whatever that might mean for like a disassociation with nature and a disassociation with wildlife, it has funding implications because states, even if you hate hunters and anglers, you can't get around the fact that hunters and anglers fund your state's wildlife apparatus. If people aren't doing those activities anymore, those funding structures fall apart. What are some of the components of the wildlife apparatus? Like what are, for somebody, let's just say someone's just, hey, I don't care about hunting. So why should I care about this? What oh, are some, some components of pieces? Of it. Exactly. I'll give you a great, for instance, anyone who hunts ducks, anyone in this country who hunts ducks, any kind of waterfowl, migratory waterfowl, ducks, geese, cranes, whatever, besides buying your state license state hunting license you, need, you usually need like a base hunting license you need a state waterfowl permit you need to go buy a federal duck stamp and for years the federal duck stamp had been 15 bucks it just raised up it raised up into the 20s all of that money from all of those millions of individuals buying those federal duck stamps all of that money goes into fund waterfowl habitat meaning it goes into wetlands work. Anytime you, if you have a bear in your yard, or let's say you realize that you have a bear in your yard getting in your garbage, when you call a number, that's going to be someone from your wildlife agency who's going to show up. That wildlife agency individual will show up. And when they show up, their salary, equipment, everything, like their agency is funded by expenditures from hunters and anglers. So a fear is that. If hunter numbers go down, our ability to fund habitat work, like habitat improvement, habitat expansion, habitat acquisition, wildlife work, disease work, reintroducing species that were extirpated from the landscape, that a lot of that work will lose its funding structure and will go away. Could you define extirpate for people who are not familiar with that word? Yeah. It's a great word. I also want to get into the catch-22 of this all. But yes, yeah, extirpate is, people are familiar with extinction, right? Extirpation is regional extinction, meaning grizzly bears are abundant. Grizzly bears are recovered in portions of Wyoming, okay? Wolves are recovered in portions of Wyoming. Wolves have been extirpated from the bulk of their range in the U.S. Grizzly bears were extirpated from California. They're not extinct, but they're regionally extinct. So you could say that they were extirpated like 
brought to regional extinction in California. There's an ongoing bit of effort, much of it funded by hunters, for instance, around reintroducing species that were extirpated through habitat destruction and overharvest. For instance, at a time, New Mexico had literally run out of elk. They had none. Now they have thriving populations of elk and elk hunting seasons you know, across the bulk of the state. But still, with as many elk as we have, as much as we associate elk hunting and seeing elk, elk are still missing from some 90% of their historic range. Everywhere was elk habitat, and they're, they're, they've been extirpated. They're gone from those places. Some of the work that's done by state agencies and other like wildlife groups, many of them hunter-based wildlife groups, is doing as much as we can to put those animals back where they belong. If you think just like, like if you look at it in terms of the turkey, at the time of European contact, we had wild turkeys in probably 39 states. There's some debate about where they were, and it wasn't static, right? Like wildlife's dynamic, you know, it expands its range, its range shrinks. We probably had turkeys in 39 states. By the late 1800s, early 1900s, we only had wild turkeys in 19 states. They vanished from 10. Only a couple states maintained any sort of turkey season. Most states, it was illegal to touch a turkey. We now have turkey hunting seasons in 49 states. So they did recovery and then some on turkeys. And that was driven by hunters. And you could, like, and someone could sit and say, like, yeah, you guys did that because you like to hunt turkeys. And I would say, yeah, there's a, a lot of truth to that. Um, there's a lot of truth to that. There was an incentive to do it, but it was done, you know. And this is the sort of work that would go down that, that you would lose if you lost that funding mechanism. Now, the catch 22 is that, and this, this is legitimate. The catch 22 is that if hunter numbers go down, it's great for any individual hunter who has less competition. You could live in a world where you're the only guy that went out and hunted. You'd have a pretty sweet situation as long as you had public approval and didn't lose in the legislative process and hunting got banned everywhere, which would probably happen pretty quickly if you were the only guy up to it because there wouldn't be a lot of people there like guarding the gate, right? So that's the catch-22. Like That's the hard part of this. Some people find it deeply offensive. Well-intentioned, well-reasoned people find it deeply offensive that you would want to expand hunter numbers. Like, what are you talking about? Why would you do that? It'd be like when I was in, I think when I was in eighth or ninth grade, I had a civics teacher. Uh, no, he was in high school. I had a civics teacher who was supposed to help all of us kids get registered to vote. And he was like, why would I want you people to register to vote? Why would I want to dilute my vote? Just a quick thanks to one of our sponsors, and we'll be right back to the show. This episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. The colorful days of fall are now upon us. Are your small businesses' needs evolving, changing with the times? Certainly true for me and my team. And despite the current uncertainty in the world, having the right people on your team can wrap you in feelings of security and peace of mind like a warm blanket. It's never been more important to find and hire the right people. LinkedIn has an active community of professionals, more than 690 million members worldwide. And when your business is ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help you find the right person quickly by matching your role with qualified candidates. Getting started is easier than ever with new features to help you find qualified candidates quickly. Manage job posts and contact candidates from one simple view on LinkedIn.com's familiar website. It's super easy. Identify strong candidates with their efficient rating system to easily get your job in front of more qualified professionals. And now you can also do all of this from your mobile device. So when your business is ready to make that next hire, or if you just want to check it out, find the right person faster with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash Tim, all caps T-I-M. Again, that's linkedin.com slash Tim to get $50 off of your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. If we look at the different extirpated species in portions of the United States, that whole spectrum, are hunters 99% or 100% focused on reintroducing basically target prey species, or are they also involved in reintroducing species? I'm not saying necessarily, but you mentioned the yeah. grizzly or, yeah. or other carnivores who would compete with them for the game that they hope to capture themselves. Yeah, that's where it gets pretty tricky, man. I would like to tell you, oh, <laughs> I would love to tell you, 
that my uh, my hunting compatriots were as supportive of efforts to recover non-game species as they were game species. But that's not true. (laughs) When you look at the habitat work, you'll find that we have these terms we use like capstone, keystone species, okay? And when you look at organizations that do habitat work, they would tell you, and they're right in telling you this, that there is a massive trickle-down effect. For instance, let's look at the work work by two groups like Ducks Unlimited, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation. We'll, we'll do three. Ducks Unlimited, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, Wild Turkey Federation. Okay. Now, you listen to those names. We'll throw a fishing one in two and say Trout Unlimited, right? You look at those names. These are like species-specific conservation groups, and their constituencies are hunters and anglers. I'm sure there's probably some person that belongs to National Wild Turkey Federation. I'm like a lifetime member of National Wild Turkey Federation. I'm sure there's people that belong to National Wild Turkey Federation that don't hunt turkeys, but in the words of Pat Dirk, and I bet they sleep with someone that does, right? (laughs) What their work winds up focusing on is it's not so much that you're managing the animals, though that happened at a time. At a time, like wildlife work in this country really was focused pretty heavily on moving animals around, okay, putting them back in places. That's become complicated for a variety of things, including disease transmission and and other issues, just like red tape issues, bureaucratic issues, disease transmission issues that make, you can't just willy-nilly truck animals around the country, dumping them out where you wish they were anymore. It's tough. These organizations now mostly focus on habitat work. Oftentimes, their primary thing is simply buying and protecting habitat. When you get into something like Keystone Species, let's say your Ducks Unlimited, and you take money and you buy wetlands, okay? You're looking for pristine, imperiled wetland habitats and buy them, often through like a willing seller, willing buyer transaction, which is one of the things, also one of the things Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation does and Turkey Federation. These places all often do the same playbook. They get grants, they raise money from donors, they do fundraisers, and a big part of their work is they identify keystone habitats for like, you know, and you hear like keystone species. So it's a thing that they want. It's a thing they like. And by securing habitat for that animal, you're securing habitat for everything that 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 lives there. Restoring natural ecosystems. In the West, for instance, one of the more imperiled ecotypes in the West is like large riparian areas. Elk winter in these large riparian areas, meaning they go down along the main rivers, okay? They go down into big river valleys to get out of the elevation, get out of the snow, and get into good grasslands and eat. If you want to help elk, it used to be the best way to help elk was tranquilizing them, lifting them up with a helicopter and moving them over a couple mountain ranges and letting them back go again. Now we recognize like the way to help elk is to look at like where is the bottleneck in their well-being. And the bottleneck in their well-being is often riparian habitat areas. So we're going to go and preserve, protect as much riparian habitat as we can. Who else uses riparian habitat and who else likes a lot of elk? Well, wolves like it in the winter. Wolves need a lot of elk. So by helping elk through improving their habitat and protecting their habitat, you're helping everything on the landscape from songbirds to insects, pollinators, raptors. You're helping everything. People definitely recognize this when they participate in these activities, but the motivation is that people like elk. They like to hunt elk and they want a shitload of elk. And you can critique their motivation all you want, but then you can't really, you have to then look at like, what is the sum thing? The sum part of it is that a group like Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation or National Wild Turkey Federation, right? They have every year they add to the net amount of pristine wildlife habitat that exists in this country. And you you cannot say the same thing about PETA. You mm. can't say it. When it really comes down to really saving animals, that's saving habitat. The animals, you give them the right place, the animals, for the most part, take care of themselves. And that's what's being done by hunters and anglers. And I suppose that would, and you know so much more about this, but that would be, in some respect, conditional upon letting the full spectrum of species 
flourish that are supported by this preservation or conservation of habitat for, say, the elk during oh. winter periods, right? So, so yeah, so I, forgot, wolf, I forgot that part. Yeah, there's a yeah, lot. There's a tremendous suppressed- amount of animosity. There's a tremendous amount of animosity toward wolves among in, in the hunting community. It's definitely not across the board. I know a lot of hunters that really like to see wolves and welcome wolves on the landscape. But yeah, I should clarify that when it comes to, I'm speaking very generally here. Okay, I'm speaking very generally. I would say, in general. Let me put it this way. Let's take a state that doesn't even have wolves. I would say that if someone proposed reintroducing wolves in Missouri, they would get an enormous amount of pushback from deer hunters. When someone decided to do reintroduction work in portions of Missouri on turkeys, I do not think they would have gotten any pushback (laughs) from hunters. So yeah, what people like all predators, I look at it a little bit like this, you know, when a coyote runs into a red fox, he likes to kill it. When a wolf runs into a coyote, he likes to kill it. Uh, predators tend to want to reduce their competition. And I think that you could say that about hunters in general, though there are many, many, many exceptions. I know some very avid hunters, lifelong, very avid hunters who really welcome wolves as wolves expand their range every year welcome wolves back on the landscape and even within those people that welcome back on the landscape you'll find differences there's a push right now and there's a there's like a referendum vote in colorado coming right up to sort of like mandate the reintroduction of wolves in colorado a lot of people are uneasy with that the reason they're uneasy with that is wolves are coming in naturally drifting down from Wyoming. It's as nuanced as this. You'll have people say, why would we reintroduce them when they're showing up at their own pace through natural migration? And that's like a pretty nuanced perspective, right? I welcome them walking in. I don't welcome them flying in. So it's hard to draw these sort of like real hard and fast rules about people's attitudes about it. And there's a real contradiction, like a, like a funny part of this I like to point out to people. Alaska still has wolves and grizzlies, you know, I don't know, across 99 or 95% of their historic range in Alaska. Alaska doesn't have large, they don't have large land mammals on the Endangered Species Act, right? They've maintained all their stuff. Uh, Wolves, everywhere you go, there's a likelihood of running into wolves. You're going to run into grizzlies. Yet American hunters all dream of going up to hunt in Alaska. And you always want to point out, like, are you sure? I, you hate wolves. That place is full of wolves. There must not be any game in Alaska. <laughs> How could there be game in Alaska? They have wolves. And you would think with some people that wolves coming back into certain areas would mean the sure death of all ungulates that live there. And I think that's an exaggeration, but wolves don't eat granola bars either. You know, they eat seven pounds of meat a day, <laughs> seven pounds of meat a day. They're alive 365 days a year. They kill a lot of shit. And to say like how hunters think about it is really tough, man, because it's the full array of thoughts. But I'll say this. We don't like those wolves as much as we like those elk. <laughs> and that's <laughs> that I can promise you is true. Yeah, the the wolf conversation, I remember somebody put it to me as a you know, wolf. Well, wolves in general are the Middle East of conservation. <laughs> he, said, <if> you, <laughs> he said, if you want really, really strong emotions and a lot of polarity, then that is the right place to focus. There's a really good piece in the New Yorker. There's a profile on, uh, I think it's Karen Vardaman called The Persuasive Power of the Wolf Lady, which is about a go-between between these these two polar extremes. And you actually had, uh, I had a, a, someone named Mike Phillips. I don't know if, if you know that name. He was, he was in Montana, but was involved with the Yellowstone wolf reintroduction. Oh, yeah, yeah. And you had a scientist also on your podcast, Diane Boyd. That was, that was outstanding. That was yeah. a that was a really, really, really dense and also entertaining episode. So for people who want to to dig into that, and I think Dave Meech is that another? Am I getting that right? M e c h. I'm not, not. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. He's also somebody. If people want to learn more about this, he's another person who who focuses quite heavily on the the wolf component. Yeah. Colorado is faced with a very similar situation that is what Montana was faced with 
when they did a reintroduction in, you know, essentially in Wyoming, you know, in Yellowstone National Park, is that there were animals coming in naturally. There were animals coming in naturally from Canada. We would have landed eventually where in the future from today, we would have landed where we are now without doing the reintroduction. And and some people would say the same thing about Colorado. They're headed that direction. There are wolves showing up. It used to be like a rumor. It was debated. It's just an absolute fact now. Like there are wolves in Colorado uh, coming in on their own. And some people prefer that because the social tensions become lower. There's a thing that can happen with animals. You might call it the spotted owlification of certain species where when conservation becomes so partisan and so political, oftentimes an animosity toward the animal develops because the animal becomes emblematic of what some people might view as federal overreach, right? And like something being shoved down their throats. And so politically and culturally, it seems that it's a little safer to let things happen gradually and naturally than it is to force your hand by politicizing biology. It seems super, super tricky, right? Because you have so many subtleties here. And like you said, whether it's face masks or spotted owl or wolves, once things become politically associated, whether by just circumstance and momentum or by some kind of engineering on one side or both sides for voting purposes, it complicates matters a lot. And then I would also... That, that's, it's really interesting that you... That you I love that, the, the mention of face masks, where, yeah, you're right. We're not talking about face masks. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're not, not talking, talking about, about face masks. It's like, it's the, we're not actually talking about the thing on your face. We're talking about like this whole right. set of ideas associated with the thing, right? Yeah, that's a good point. Exactly, exactly. And humans are motivated, right? So you, you really have to take into consideration the motivations of whoever is speaking, whether they are hunters, non-hunters, or anyone with incentives in the world, right? And because there are people who would say, and we don't have to spend a ton of time on this, but that wolves were so forcefully removed. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to apply the word artificial, but they were certainly with overwhelming sort of show of force and poison. With, yeah, they <laughs> removed. were removed with intent. Yeah, with intent. With, with right? like Poisoning specific, of, specific stated intent. Elk yeah. were removed not with a, they were removed not with specific intent. No one set out to be like, I would like to remove elk from the landscape. It just happened. Right. Right. But yeah, wolves were like, right. no, it was a plan. There was a bounty. There was poison. There was a plan. And the plan worked too well. Yeah. Yeah. So if anybody wants to wade into the Middle East of conservation, that's a good place to do it. Uh, oh, you mentioned fr a friendships end over wolves, man. Yeah. It is a tense conversation for a lot of folks. You mentioned Alaska. I want to talk about Alaska, and I, I, I want to give a slice of life uh, mini profile of Steve Runella. So this, this is going to be another flashback moment. And for those interested, we, this is captured on footage. But I'm not sure all of it is captured. So you and I traveled up to Alaska at one point and ended up, fair to say, pretty much in the middle of nowhere. I mean, one of the most remote points in North America. Got grounded for weather for a while, and uh, it was just an incredible adventure. And we had at one point, actually at more than one point, but at least at one point on camera, we had a grizzly, a barren ground grizzly, which you could explain, run into our camp. And the reason I bring up that is, A, that was something I'd never experienced before. And uh, I and other members of the film crew were like, Steve, what do we do? Steve, what do we do? And this bear was running around this body of water straight towards camp. And I don't know how far away it was. Let's call it half mile. You can correct me, but let's just say a half mile, which is not very far. And meanwhile, you had just gotten out of your tent. This is the part that I don't know if it's on camera or not. You just gotten out of your tent. And I don't know if you remember this. A bunch of mosquito repellent yeah. had spilled in your tent. 100% deep. <laughs> had spilled and eaten a hole through the floor of my tent and warped my phone case and ruined my phone. <laughs> so so you get up and you're like, God damn it. Ate, a hole, ate God a hole through my it. tent. And that's you're, the stuff we wear on our skin. <laughs> and, right. So you are so you're just like stamping around, furious, cursing 
and while this bear is is running around this body of water and uh everyone's like steve um Steve, what do you want to do here, Steve? Say Steve. And you're like, God damn it, motherfucker. You're so angry. And eventually they're like, yeah, 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 yeah. And you like grab a, a shotgun and shoot in the air and wave your hands and spook this bear, which is a pretty large grizzly bear. You could speak to it, at least from my perspective, certainly a lot bigger than my dog. Uh, ran like a quarter mile away, kind of sat down and looked at us and just kind of waited. Uh, but could you, could you maybe add some color to that story? Because it certainly burned and etched the experience indelibly into my mind but what are, what are some of the details that i'm missing here yeah you're right about the deet the bottle 100 percent deet and man it ruined it wound up ruining a lot of my stuff because it had given i had given it a lot of time to fester spilled <laughs> in the corner of my tent and leaked out of like it was a mess in terms of the bear yeah so i'll point this out we've been talking about grizzly bears you know we, we've touched on grizzly bears in the lower 48 anytime we use the word grizzly bear if you ask a taxonomist like a geneticist they would tell you that grizzly bears in the lower 48 brown what we call brown bears kodiak bears barren ground grizzlies up on the arctic slope where we were up in the brooks range it's it's all the same species right so they have big differences physiological differences they look different they act different in these different places but it's just different you know kind of like manifestations of the same animal and, and one of the things that these barren ground grizzlies up there or uh you know bears in the interior a thing they're known for is they have these enormous home ranges a brown bear let's say a kodiak brown bear everybody's heard of that like biggest bears in the world biggest you know brown bears in the world they might have a very very small home range they eat a lot of salmon they live in a resource rich environment they got their spot and they, they stay there and, and defend it against other boars. But up in these areas, uh, you, you have, it's, a, I hate to say, so I don't want people to take it the wrong way up in the, like the Arctic slope and in the Brooks range, it's a, it's a resource poor area. It looks amazing. It's gorgeous. When you're out in front of a migrating herd of caribou, it looks like the land is like crawling with animals. But the thing is you could sit there at times of the year, you could sit there for months and nothing will come by. And so a big animal like that just covers ground and they need to be extraordinarily opportunistic. They're going to be eating primarily, probably the bulk of that animal's diet is going to be vegetation, berries, roots, but they're just on the move all the time because they're always out looking for like that big windfall, a big hit, like a big protein hit. And so they cover ground and they have an amazing nose on them. I one time was caribou hunting in a different area east of where you and I were. And we had gone three miles up a tributary to a river and killed a caribou and gutted it and hauled the meat back down to the main stem. That night, we were sitting on the main branch of the river at the mouth of that tributary and watched a grizzly coming down, digging up roots in the gravel bar. And it got to the mouth of that tributary and you could see something strike its nose to where like a scent and it stood up on its back legs, waved its nose in the air for a long time, spun around, did it again, and eventually ran up that tributary. And I didn't go check, but I, I am certain based on the wind patterns that he smelled that gut pile from three miles away. And that's what they're out doing, man. They're covering ground. And so on that trip we were on, we had, I don't know at the time, one or two caribou on the ground and there's no trees there. You know, it's, it's a barren land, you know, a treeless environment and the trees that are there are shrubby and doesn't do any good. Meaning you can't hang it up in a tree to keep it safe. So if you have a cache of meat that you're trying to protect, the best thing is to put it where you can keep an eye on it, like close to camp. If you move it away a mile, it's just going to get, you know, consumed and you won't even know, you won't be able to protect it. You won't even know that it happened. If you put it right in your camp, you're inviting stuff to come right in your camp. So you just kind of put it off where you can keep an eye on it. 75 yards away, 100 yards away, depending on what's going on. And this bear comes along to claim that caribou. Uh, he's probably done that a ton of times. He comes in and probably has in his life countless times fought off other bears to claim a dead caribou, fought off wolves to claim their caribou. Uh, in that place too, it's very likely that that animal had never had a direct experience with a human before. Sees aircraft, right? Whatever. Maybe smelled people somewhere, but probably never had direct experience. It just is knowing that it's cruising along and probably had miles away long before we knew it was there, had smelled that animal and was coming to get it. 
and then it gets there and you present to it in a way that's kind of like authoritatively saying, this is already mine. This thing is claimed. You have no right to be here. Like that's what you're trying to express to that animal. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't work. I got a lot of friends, you know, people lose stuff to those things all the time. But in that case, that little show of force, like I'm not afraid of you. Uh, this is my shit. It is not your shit worked. And he, it, it ran off and then surprisingly didn't come back in the dark and try again. <laughs> well, I remember going to bed that night and it was just like, you know, we're in these skin thin single person tents. And uh, <laughs> yeah. I was saying to uh, come half blanket on his name. Was it Nick? It was Nick. Who was yeah, it was Nick with us. Nick Brigden. Yeah, Nick. Yeah, yeah, Nick was with us. And I was like, well, hope you don't die tonight. And he was like, you too, man. <laughs> just... <laughs> oh, yeah, because they can have a real attitude about claiming stuff, man. You know, claiming a kill. And people get every year, it's kind of amazing to think, you know, every year in the lower 48, you know, multiple people get killed most every year from grizzly bears. This is going to sound callous, but you know, that that could happen is, is like, I hold that risk is kind of cool. I like it. Like, I don't mind there being something big and scary like that out there. In fact, I drive a lot of emotional satisfaction from it. And this is beyond any sense that that I, I don't like it when humans play God and decide to remove animals from the landscape. But just I, I just I, I like that. I feel more alive, better, more engaged, happier in places that have that full suite of large predators, omnivores, you know, out on the landscape. So I, I relish those interactions. And I also am aware that, you know, at some point in time, I'm part of a very high risk group around bears and I don't think that something will happen to me, but I'm part of a high risk group. And it's like, I'll feel lucky if I get out of life without having someone I'm very close to get mauled by a bear or killed in a small airplane crash. Mm. You know, it's just like things yeah. I recognize is like, those are re actual, those are actual real threats. People fixate on the wrong things when they imagine danger. But if you're spending a lot of time hunting in these areas, that's not a fantasy that you could get mixed up with a bear. It strikes me that if we're talking about, for instance, the bear attacks, uh, which are so visually memorable for anyone who's seen The Revenant, for instance, they're gonna they're gonna have a movie they can play in their mind of what a bear attack looks like. Yeah. Where a small plane crash may just be off menu; they just don't have a, a <laughs> reference for it. But That's great. It, we definitely it, don't have one for hypothermia. It, yeah, we don't have one for hypothermia. No one goes it's in the very, woods being like, "Dude, I hope I don't die of hypothermia." But I'm like, you yeah, know what? That's like, I'd be watching out for that. <laughs> yeah, it's not it's cinematically compelling, but it, it sure will kill you just as well. And are you more afraid? Because you you take a lot of small aircraft, I would imagine. I mean, certainly we did. We took these mm -hmm. you know bush planes. These are tiny, tiny aircraft, and you are not landing on a perfectly manicured asphalt uh, at all times, <laughs> right? And do you worry more about the aircraft or in this case, bears, mm. predators. The thing about the aircraft is like, there's a sort of statistical bit of it, right? Like you can look, you go to a place like Alaska where it's like a, it's a primary mode of transportation. Like in most places, like having a private single engine plane is a, a hobbyist, right? Or like a, a flying enthusiast, you know, it's oftentimes flying for the sake of flying. You go to a place like Alaska and much of Canada, you know, it's like, that's like how you get around. Right. Right. Um, it's, it's like how you do it. I remember it was, uh, I think it was Ted Stevens in Alaska. I think it was him that had talked about an occupational hazard of politics in that state was small aircraft um, and then died in one. But you can look at like hours, you know, like crashes per hour or whatever. So someone like me, no, I, I don't have any real reason to worry about it. I have a brother who's a who's an ecologist in Alaska, and he spends a lot of time in single engine aircraft, a lot of time in, you know, fixed wing and helicopters. And yeah, man, you get to a point where all those people that, that do that, they all know people, right? They all know people that that's happened to. I've to the point now where like, you know, I've been in planes that I later knew crashed. Uh, that's spooky. Yeah. But it's like, for me, it's just so minor. Like, you know, I've, you know, some number of trips a year, but the people I know, like, especially people in the, in the fish and wildlife 
the hoodoo fish and wildlife work up there i do worry man i do worry like my brother spends a lot of time in those things and i worry about that but for me if you're at least open to thinking statistically personally i have no reason to be concerned well for people who want to get a glimpse of alaska you can certainly read some amazing books like coming into the country yeah by john mcphee but if you want a visual sampler i just pulled this up i don't know if this is accurate because it's on imdb it could be it says season three episode one of meat eater that sounds right. is is our episode where uh, we travel to the remotest corner of alaska to catch the annual migration of the famed western arctic caribou herd can people find where can people find if they can these these older episodes you can find all the older episodes if you go to TheMeatEater.com and you'll go there and you'll find you'll you'll find your avenue to all the older episodes. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks like the episode is called True North Alaska North Slope Caribou, season yeah. three, episode one. We'll we'll put that in the show notes, also, guys. So yeah, those are also they're they're also available in our broadcast by Sportsman Channel, you know, uh, like Outdoor Channel and Sportsman Channel. But then you can also find them by going to TheMeatEater.com. They're not available on Netflix. We're going to be doing some things soon around distribution with some of our older material, but that's where you can find them right now. Perfect. Let's move from television to books. And in this case, books that are not yours. We can certainly spend more time on books that are yours. But I read that you recommend, and I don't know how old this interview was, A few books very commonly, Sun of the Morning Star by Evan S. Connell, Arctic Dreams by Barry Lopez, and Boone by Daniel Morgan. Do you still, or would you still recommend those? What's special about these books? Sun of the Morning Star is about the events leading up to and including the battle at the Little Bighorn where Custer's last stand. It's a great story. I mean, it's just like a story that just makes its own gravy. <laughs> it, it's just incredible, the brutality and just just weirdness of that campaign, the culmination of Custer's involvement in that campaign. One of the things I love most about it, besides just like phenomenal reporting, is the openness with which the author approaches how different people remember things. And reading it, you get a, a, a sense of how there are at any given time, you know, and this is just so applicable today, there are a hundred truths. I don't mean 100, like one, zero, zero. There are as many truths as there are people about what went on during something. And his exploration of people's accounts of what happened that day and the days surrounding it when Custer died and who did what, and who was where, and who thought what, and uh, what was going on. It's just the question marks that loom over that stuff are unbelievable. It's a great telling. It's a great piece about just like human memory, but also a phenomenal history of the American West and a phenomenal history of the Indian Wars. To say like what led up to the Battle of Little Bighorn, you can approach that in a hundred ways, man. You can take a 500-year approach, right? You could take a, 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 a decade approach. You could take a week long approach and he kind of manages to sort of like cover off on all those ways to lead up to how in the world did a couple hundred U.S. soldiers get wiped out, killed off by Plains Indians armed with antiquated firearms and bows and arrows in to quote one of the Sioux participants in the battle named Gaul in the amount of time that it takes a hungry man to eat his dinner. Uh, (laughs) It's just so bizarre. Um, It's just candy. Like it's, it's history candy. And he's such a great, he's just great. I feel it like a Western literature masterpiece. Arctic dreams um, is a work of natural history. Uh, uh, Arctic dreams is a book about the Arctic. One of the most profound parts about it for me is that the author, Barry Lopez is very uneasy with hunting. I would venture to say that, Barry Lopez would probably not like me too much, but what, what would he? What would he dislike about you? He's just very uneasy with hunting. Got it. He's on. You know, if you read, he's uneasy with hunting. He spends a lot of time with indigenous hunters in the Arctic, so he spends a lot of time with Eskimo Inuit hunters, and he is at peace 
he, he's relatively at peace with that, though he recognizes the violence. But he's at peace with that indigenous approach to hunting. You would look at that, and I find that's often quite true. People who uh, would be like, they don't want violence toward animals, right? But they're very accepting if it's done by an indigenous person, as though the animal somehow feels that pain differently. You can't really ignore that. If you're a walrus getting shot in the head on an ice floe, I don't know that you care who's pulling the trigger. <laughs> right. I really don't think that that is of issue to them. But people are, tend to be much more comfortable with that. And uh, he gets into it. And Artie Dreams also just like, is someone trying to comprehend an incomprehensible landscape. Tim, I don't know if you remember being out there on the, in the Arctic there. Do you remember the tussocks? Oh, well, I was going to, you know, I was going to bring those up because you mentioned the lack of trees. I was going to make t-shirts for everybody. Do you remember that? <laughs> I love tussocks. Yeah. Because those fucking ankle breakers, man, you got to, I mean, they're, you, sh- you can describe them. They're like one third inflated volleyballs covered with <laughs> yeah. fucking dog hair. I mean, yeah. th- they're like the most dangerous things you can think of. And it's just like just many, many hundreds of square miles of these things. Yeah. And you can't decide but, if you're going to try walking between the tussocks. Or on yeah. the tussocks. And the tussocks are, you know, they might be like 12 inches, 18 inches tall, and they flop around. I always liken it to if you filled a gym full of six inches of water and then took basketballs and somehow like tethered them to the floor <laughs> so that all the basketballs are touching. <laughs> and then tried to walk across And then that. you'd yeah. be like, I don't know, you got to go across there for a few miles. And then you might figure out some way to walk on those basketballs. I don't know. Or you might find some way to get your feet wedged down between those basketballs. But either way, like I invite you to do this little journey. Uh, but in Arctic Dreams, one of the best parts of Arctic Dreams is talking about a botanist who spends their day face down on a tussock, <laughs> counting, doing a survey on that tussock of the vegetation on that tussock and the thousands of blades of, you know, sedges and Forbes and right, and just trying to comprehend like what's going on on this tussock, all these plant species, right, incredibly dense, and then having this feeling of like doing that and then looking up in any direction you can look as far as the eye can see is just more and more and more of those tussocks, right? It's just like an incomprehensible landscape, and that book does a wonderful job of spelling that out. And it does a wonderful job of like challenging some things, um, of challenging some things and challenging some assumptions. And that book won the National Book Award. Yeah, I was it's, just, it's, uh, looking it up. It's phenomenal. That's that's it's that's phenomenal. no joke. Just as a just as a side note, uh, I still want to hear about Boone. But the, I think perhaps the most nervous that I was at any point in that trip, in the. Uh, Brooks Range was well. If I'm being honest, it was probably the the grizzly bear acutely, but nothing happened. But w- when I had a lot of time to meditate on the dozens of ways that I could like fracture a leg or dislocate a hip and really be fucked, because you know how hard it is to get to this place, and it's not like you just call someone on a cell phone and you know an Uber helicopter shows up in five minutes. Like you could be stuck there for a very long time. Oh, well, <laughs> was, yeah, weather depending, you'd be there days. Yeah. Yeah, so when we were packing out the meat from the caribou hunt, and so imagine you're in this this gym that you visualized earlier, right? With with the six inches of water, with all the basketballs touching and tethered to the floor, and you have to walk across that, and then take a backpack with I don't know, you tell me. I'm not, I, I don't recall what percentage of the body weight of a caribou would end up being harvestable meat, but I don't know what sixty to a hundred pounds on each person's back, maybe. Something like that. Oh I, yeah, I you'd have it, you know you'd have a total of in you know over a couple you know couple hundred pounds potentially. Yeah. Well, so, that might be a bit much, but yeah, you'd be with the, with the bones in there. You're moving. You're moving a couple hundred pounds for sure. Plus, right? Yeah. So that's, in, that's yeah, what... impacts ranging like at fifty pounds, a backpack is substantial. It decreases your mobility. At ninety and a hundred pounds, a backpack is you're like, wow, this is sort of a, you need to step carefully. Like you're like, you you could hurt yourself carrying this weight. Like it's not good for you to carry this weight. 
And I remember, you know, you commenting that if there were a sport that just involved carrying heavy weights for long distances, that you could be, you know, Olympic that'd be the medalist. One, that'd be the one sport I'd be good at. <laughs> and in my case, it's like, when's the last time that I walked on half inflated volleyballs for a mile with a hundred pounds or eighty pounds on my back? And the answer is never. And I was like, wow, like, okay, my like glute medius and all these stabilizers in the hip have no training for this whatsoever. So thank God there are people like uh, Dan Doty and other monsters uh, <laughs> behind the cameras who are like, yeah, let me just grab that for you. I'm like, okay. Hurts my masculine pride a bit, but I'm uh, less interested in fracturing both my legs. So I'll take the help. Thanks yeah, very much. Trained tussock walkers. <laughs> <laughs> so Boone by Daniel Morgan. Yeah. I've had a lifelong fascination with Boone. And uh, any little kid that grows up loving to hunt and trap and fish and stuff like you're aware of Boone, right? You're aware of this pioneer Boone. And at various times in history, he was remembered as, you know, an Indian fighter, right? Even though he never, he didn't really have a big appetite for that. And if you look at what he did, he actually went out of his way, typically went out of his way to avoid violence, but an Indian fighter, a pioneer, an explorer, hunter, trapper. And, you know, and at various times in my life, I've been in love with different aspects of what he did. But, and he often, in old books, you know, he was kind of presented as this swashbuckling, you know, Davy Crockett figure, right? Whistling through the woods, just being a hero. But there's a lot of complexity there around this person and sort of this idea that he was heavily involved in destroying what it was that he loved. He made his money in a variety of ways, and he was a horrible had made a lot of business mistakes, a lot of land mistakes and different investments and stuff. But like for the most of his life, he was a commercial hunter and he was a trespasser. So he was hunting places, one that had native Americans that claimed it and lived on it. And they fought amongst themselves over ownership of these hunting grounds. But there was that, which meant, you know, next to nothing to him. And then there was the fact that he was trespassing on land that he wasn't supposed to come on from his own government. Um, in the time of the colonies, the, we, we were always striking these deals where we would assure the tribes like, oh, no, 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 this is about it. We're not going to go any more west. Uh, we promise our settlers won't go over that line. And the rest of that's yours. We'll take this. And, and Boone didn't care about that stuff at all either. He just went where he wanted to go. Um, and we now like do this. We describe this as a sort of celebration of freedom. But it would be uh, if you took that attitude today, you would be called an interloper and a poacher and you'd wind up in jail. But he was pursuing his trade. He hunted deer for leather, not not so much meat. They hunted deer for leather, leather workwear. Um, it was sold and tanned and they made like the equivalent of making car hearts today. He did that for a lot of the year. And then he hunted bears for the oil and meat markets. He would go out, kill bears smoke the meat, render the fat, sell the smoked meat, bear bacon, and sell the bear oil. And that's how this guy made his living. The book does a great telling of all this stuff. But a thing that I love about Boone, and I've come to respect about Boone, is he exemplifies this part of my history as a hunter. And when I say my history, I don't mean the things that happened in my life, but as a continuation of a sort of discipline, as a continuation of hunting in America, he's this really pinnacle moment where you have this person that loved wilderness, loved the outdoors, risked his neck day to day to go to the wildest places and celebrate them. And he liked those places. He wanted to be there. Boone would sometimes go on a hunt that would last two years. <laughs> Gone from his wife and family for two years hunting and lost all the hides he built up twice by having them confiscated by Native Americans who resented his trespassing. He liked it. He could have found a hundred other ways to make a living. That was what he was. He was a woodsman. But he was one of these guys in our own history who was instrumental in wiping wildlife off the face of America. And it's this part of this conundrum we're in where we look and I'm like that. I, I celebrate that guy, right? His skill set. You can't begin to comprehend his skill set. All the shit they did, they did without flashlights. It's like you can't begin to comprehend the skill set and admire. And like if I could go back in time, my number one pick would be to go through the Cumberland Gap with Daniel Boone the first time he went through the Cumberland Gap and cross down into the hunting grounds of Kentucky to do that walk with him. But 
my God, the damage, like the damage. Now, was was the the damage his influence or was it just the manner in which that he hunted and what he represented being done on a wider scale? What was the damage? Both influence by opening up those places. It would have happened anyways. Someone else would have done it by opening up settlement, opening up, clearing the road for the displacement of indigenous people, clearing the road for people who would destroy the habitat but also just the mechanical, physical removal of all that wildlife. He one time processed, uh, uh, I think it's right around us, I think this is correct. I think one time he processed 109 black bears in a year. (laughs) That's a lot of bears. Oh, listen, they wiped them. We talked about extirpation earlier. They were wiping out stuff without even knowing they'd wiped it out. There used to be bison in Nashville. There's a guy that saw a thousand bison at a mineral lick near Nashville one time. People came into New Orleans and saw bison. They were on the beach. It seems as though people ran into them near Washington, D.C. These guys shot stuff. They shot stuff so fast and so thoroughly that the shit was gone and they didn't know it was gone. Yeah, that's incredible. We now sit around, people are, we sit around now like the last bear of, you know, he killed the last bear in Indiana or whatever, you know. It's like a, it's like a thing people used to kind of celebrate it. I mean, they were just rapacious. But. They had no compre. I don't think they had any comprehension of what they were doing. There's a story I like to tell a lot about uh, with with bison. There's a story I like to tell a lot about the hide hunters that. Can I pause you for one second? Oh, just, oh please, just, just please, to establish yeah. your bona fides. So I'm looking at one of your many books, and this one is American Buffalo in Search of a Lost Icon. 1,213 reviews, average five stars. So you, you, you've done a lot of reading and research related to this. Please continue. Oh yeah, I, I knew that world real well back when I was working on that book. But there's a great story about like what the damage that hunters do without knowing they've done it is, you know, it's, so I'm going to just throw some wild round numbers out. Like at the end of the Civil War, it's estimated there were maybe about 15 million buffalo, bison, on the Great Plains, right? And we were hunting them for their tongues, meat, but mostly we were hunting them for their hides. There was a there was a strong market for leather and hides, and we had a lot of market hunters chasing after them. So the Civil War ends. People say there's maybe about 15 million. We really turn our attention west. We start cutting railroads. We open up avenues of trade, meaning you can you could kill buffalo and stick the hides on rail cars and send them to market. We had uh, we were feeding an industrial revolution. And so there's a lot of money to be made shooting hides. And they kind of killed off the ones in the south from the Texas Plains, Kansas, right? And then they started working on the northern herds. And some people say that that by the time the Northern Pacific Railroad made it into, had crossed the western Dakotas, made it into eastern Montana, there was maybe a couple million left in the last wild herd. And they shot that herd out in the winter of 81, 82, 1881, 1882, gone, right? A couple years later, this guy Hornaday, William T. Hornaday, goes out there to collect specimens for the Smithsonian. Like the assumption is they'll just be gone. They'll be exterminated, extinct. And he wants to collect some hides and bones and stuff so that man in the future will be able to behold what these things looked like before they were driven to extinction. Uh, And he comments, when he gets out to Miles City, he comments how the people that live around Miles City, the ranchers, the merchants, were people that had been involved in that last big slaughter. And then they were just hanging around waiting for the next herd to come through. Everybody knew there must be a bunch more up north or somewhere. And they waited and a year goes by and none came. And they waited and two years goes by and none came. And eventually they kind of got like, huh, and set up various businesses and ranching operations and gradually occurred to them that like, oh shit, we got them all accidentally. Right. It's like, so when you look at these people, like getting back to this boon thing, which is the question, when you look at these people that were engaged in this stuff, like, I don't think they, they knew, they knew that something was amiss and they knew that like things were changing. Cause that's why Boone had to constantly move Pennsylvania to North Carolina. He constantly marched West. By the time he died, it's rumored that he had made it all the way up into the Rockies following the Missouri river up on a hunting trip. He always had to move West because they killed everything and it forced him to need to move. He was aware of this, but I don't know that they really were like villains. I don't know that they really were acting with malicious intent. But my God, were they destructive and also just cool. <laughs> it's like, it's a good book. It's, a, it's the best piece yeah. of work about Boone. Well, these are all amazing stories. Your story is pretty incredible. And want to rewind to your first 
sold piece of writing. So you mentioned this in passing. We didn't get really into it, but your plan A was to be a professional fur trapper up until something like <laughs> yeah, yeah. 22, right? I had to give up and by then. Yeah, I had to give up uh, for a whole whole host of reasons. And you decide that plan B was to become an outdoor writer. So your your first story sold in 2000 to outside, is that right? Yeah, that, like that? that was the yeah. first like piece I like sold for money. What was that piece about? That you remember? Oh, I do. I, I I'm still mad about the title. Um, <laughs> you don't get to pick your own title. They called my article "Getting Jiggy," <laughs> which <laughs> I, I'm still mad about it. Twenty years later. <laughs> I love dearly. I love dearly, and I'm still friends with the person who oversaw that process. I've never told her about my my anger, but it was about <laughs> so for a while, for a semester, when I was young, like every, I was young in Michigan, and everyone that if you hunted and fished, you you know where you needed to go live was what we called the UP. That was like the cool spot. And so, some of my closest friends, my brothers, they like went up to the UP to go to college. Because UP Upper Peninsula, Upper Peninsula, Michigan. Yeah, so and it was just like kind of like the, the the promised land, you know, or that's how we viewed it anyway. And I went up there to live for a semester at Lake Superior State University. My brother Danny, he stayed up there and graduated from there. So I was in and out of there all the time. And there was this hydroelectric diversion canal in Lake Superior where they peel water off the St. Mary's River and run it through a channel and run it through a hydroelectric dam, right? So just to turn turbines to make electricity and uh. This canal had a lot of aquatic insects that lived in it. And so fish would gather at the outwash of this dam. So where they release the water out after passing through the turbines, they release this water back into the St. Mary's River. And it would carry with it a lot of food. And you'd go up and like we would actually tie our boats up to the dam. And you're just fishing for whitefish, Lake Superior, Great Lakes whitefish. You're fishing for whitefish in the outwash of the dam. And we would sometimes, my brothers had figured this out you could leave the bar it was competitive to get the right tunnel the right turbines that seemed to hold a lot of fish for whatever reason i never understood certain turbines held a lot of fish no matter how early you got up you know some dude had beat you some old timer beat you to the spot so my brothers hit on this idea just to leave the bar at one or two in the morning whatever and go out with a sleeping bag <laughs> Okay. And, I was, and I thought sleep the bar there. was a technical term you mean the bar oh no it'd be like you're... well screw getting up at five let's just sleep there <laughs> so I would go out with my brother Danny and, and uh, they'd run, we'd run a boat up in and we'd go in the tunnel. Like you're like, you're in the bowels of the dam. Cause it's warm in there from the turbine. And there's these like little hooks in there and you could drive your boat into the tunnel and tie off and just like sleep in a sleeping bag. And then at five in the morning when some old, you know, some old timer fishing fanatic shows up, lo and behold, you know, you're laying there hung over in a sleeping bag ready to fish. And I, I, I wrote a, a piece about this. Oh, you know what? I was wrong earlier. That wasn't the one they called getting jig. Yeah. I was mistaken about that. That was called Dawn patrol. But getting jig was, a, was another article I wrote about something very similar in Seattle. I'm sorry. I was, mis I, I screwed that up. Dawn patrol. And I sold, I was still in graduate school and sold. I remember for 4,000 bucks and I couldn't imagine that amount of money. That's a big it was deal. like an unfathomable amount of money. <laughs> We partied for days after that. <laughs> Were you always a an able writer or did you do something between I guess 22 or whenever you began thinking about outdoor writers and option what enabled you to get to that point because I am not a features writer mm -hmm. or a magazine writer so it's hard for me to I don't, it's hard for me to speculate in that world, but I wouldn't imagine that most folks start off with a $4,000 payment for a magazine piece. They're probably doing bit small yeah. stuff here, there. Oh, I did all that small work after that. I, you know, it took a long time. I got encouragement. You know, it's so hard to like pick out like what exact moment turned it, but, but absolutely this, this goes out to all the school teachers out there. When I was in 10th grade, I had a, English teacher named Bob Heaton, Mr. Heaton, took interest in me as a writer. You know, I later went to, I did a, you know, Master of Fine Arts, right? I did all, I studied with phenomenal writers. I've had many mentors. I've had people pull strings for me. I've had great advantages, right? Expert technical training, all, all this stuff. It, it's really hard to talk about how you got somewhere where you are. But 
I feel as though if Mr. Heaton, if this 10th grade English teacher hadn't spotted something there and, and made me aware of it, that I probably wouldn't have done what I did. I think that's pretty fair to say. He, this is kind of interesting around this. I don't know if you're, how much you pay attention to, to, you know, like the education system today, but there's this thing where like, we're more and more into like grooming kids for this fear that we're more and more into grooming kids for standardized testing. And like, I guess at that time, he, Mr. Heaton didn't really give it. He didn't give a shit about, he didn't give a shit about whether you're like, you're like doing the assignments. I mean, if you were a slacker or weren't trying, he wanted you to do the assignments, you know, but this guy gave a lot of room. If he saw something you liked, he just gave you a lot of room to like focus in and explore. This sounds like a lot for 10th grade English. It's like you go there for an hour a day and half the time you're not paying attention. But in that time, in a couple classes I took with him after, in that time, he like he he took the time to develop things in kids. And and maybe took the time to develop things in kids who otherwise didn't have a lot of prospects. And, and that's what led me onto the path. And it's it's been like wild because, you know, going on and I want to be a writer and and kind of backed into doing television and backed into doing a, a podcast and now helping to run a, a, a an outdoor media company. But yeah, man, maybe it boils down to that. And the trapping thing is I started, I've set my first trap with my brothers in 1984 and there had been these insanely high fur prices since 1978 through 1982. And people were making a bunch of money trapping muskrats and stuff. I came in at the tail end of that and fur prices just went down, down, down. But in the beginning of that, I thought that I would, that's what I would do for a living. Now, you've, you've expanded quite a lot, as you mentioned, beyond the writing. Uh, before we leave the world of writing, if you were teaching a class, and for all I know, maybe you have, but if, if you were teaching a class, not an English class, but a writing class specifically, could be to 10th graders, could be to freshmen in college, doesn't really matter, but I would say could be MFA. But by that point, people have already kind of decided and honed some of their skills. So probably let's just call it 10th grade through to end of college. You could pick the age. What would you do? What would your approach look like? Are there any core books or practices or anything that you would you would use in your class? Yeah. I'm not going to do the 10th grade one, but I'll do the college one, grad school one. I just don't have the expertise to, uh, it's hard for me to understand 10th graders, even though I, you know, once upon a time was one, I, I understand college. Like I, I'm more aware of where I was just more cognizant by then. If I was going to like just writers in general, like writing in general, if I was going to give advice to someone, this is going to, I don't know if anyone else gives this advice this way. I would read everything you can get your hands on. I would pay a lot of attention to the things that you read that really speak to you, that make you feel jealous that you wish you would have wrote it. I see. Got it. Jealous of the writing itself. That you're like, my God, if I could do that, right? Pay attention to the things that make you feel like, like you want to die. It's so good. And you're so jealous. Find that handful of writers that, that make you feel that way. Try to understand what they're doing. And then don't try to mimic one of them, but create a way in which you're trying to mimic or you're trying to capture the thing that you envy about three or four different writers. because. They're too smart to be emulated. You can't copy them. They're geniuses. In trying to copy them, you will, if you're lucky and you're good, you will come up with something new because you will never succeed in copying them. That would be my advice to writers. Dig it. That's what I did. Outside of the books that we already talked about, is there a particular writer who inspires that, Jesus, if I could just do that. Oh, for me? Sense in you, yeah. Yeah, Joan Didion. This is, I'm dating myself because these are the books that were cool when I was in graduate school. Joan Didion, Ian Frazier, John McPhee, and David Foster Wallace. Mm, that's a good that's Those a good are the team. people. Those are the people that were like, if I could do that, I would be happy. Like, those are the magicians. Black magic shit, man. Yeah, black magic. Yeah, there's... <laughs> like, I don't know how they do what they do. Yeah. Yeah, there are definitely those experiences. I've been having those experiences in fiction quite a bit, even though I'm not a fiction writer. Mm -hmm. But I, it's funny when I talk to I don't I don't know if I don't know if you've written fiction. I have no, not. never. Uh, and, and I've I've spoken to some very competent fiction writers who've been like, "Oh, nonfiction's too hard," and I'm like, "Are you fucking kidding me?" <laughs> like, I don't. Yeah, I know. I mean, not, like, not good nonfiction is hard. Don't get me wrong. Like, to do anything really well takes 
dedication and some degree of, of talent, I suppose. But when I read really good fiction, I'm like, yeah, no, I can't do that. Yeah, it's that that's art. There's that like that's art. It leans in the direction of art, and I think nonfiction leans in the direction of craft. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that. We were talking about season three, episode one. You have season nine of Meteor that just launched, and you have all of these different projects. But if we're looking at Meteor, the television show, you have more than 100 episodes now. Are there any particular episodes that really stick out for you? Any particular trips that are favorites? Could be to film or experience, and maybe that's a lazy question, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Just no, to they're, see if they're, they're, they're that... different. What, what we do is an o- isn't overly produced, and so there's a huge amount of a lot of it you just can't produce because you can't be like the animal shows up now. You know, <laughs> they're not overly <laughs> right. produced, which means that there's like an actual trip happening. There's an actual journey happening with a question mark around it. Since it's not scripted, it's like so there can be the actual journey you know, the trip, you, the, the physical trip you go on. And then there's this like this product that comes out of it, this, this piece of work, this, this craft that comes out of it, which is the show. You could have a trip that isn't like hugely impactful, but the thing you make from it, the piece of entertainment that you make from it is like memorable. You love it. You know, you're like, man, like I want to have that. If in the future tombstones have like something playing on tombstones instead of just inscriptions, I would like, I would like my tombstone to play that episode over and over again. Right. But it doesn't mean that the trip was great. I, I think the, the, the things I've done, the trips I've been on that were like phenomenal trips and, in my view, great episodes were the handful of times, a, a, a couple times when we've been able to go travel on rivers and hunt and fish with Amer Indians in South America, particularly in Guyana, in Bolivia, hunting with people who are ancestral hunters and gatherers who are on a landscape, hunting and fishing on a landscape that from their view is that they've been hunting and fishing in perpetuity, probably for thousands of years, father, grandfather, on down the line. And the level of intimacy they have with the land and water where they have been raised and where they hunt and fish 200, 250 days a year, to see that is a very eye-opening, it's an eye-opening experience because it really invites you to imagine what was lost here where we live in terms of this continuity, that there's still places there where indigenous peoples, even though there's technologies emerging and stuff happening all the time and, and people can have email addresses, where there's like a continuity of like the same people, the same culture doing the same practices in the same place for hundreds or thousands of years. A level of awareness and like fine-tuned thinking comes out of that, which is like stunning to witness. And then just the cool shit, like just the, how they cook and, 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 uh, hunting practices, fishing practices. That's been things that have really impacted my worldview episodes that doing them impacted my worldview. And then also the delivery of the product the thing that people go watch when they're sitting on their living room couch at night is in my mind, like good work. Like we did good work when we did those shows. You mentioned the awareness. Are there any particular sensitivities or types of awareness, any examples that you could give where you just thought to yourself, oh, wow, that's something I haven't seen before. That's something I haven't felt before. Do any snapshots come to mind? Yeah. Spending time with these people. Tracking. Okay. Like, Detecting sign on the ground, footprints, broken blades of grass, bent things, just like animals passing through and knowing that they pass through. An awareness of bird sound in a place where it just feels like a cacophony. Have you ever watched that movie about the making of Herzog's Fitzcarraldo movie? But <laughs> you know that is so strange that you're bringing this up. The burden of dreams. Yeah, I just started watching it last night. Oh, really? That's bizarre. That's super bizarre. And that's not. I mean, this is not a movie that <laughs> you hear. No, <laughs> it's not widely spread. No one knows about. So this yes, movie. But I literally just started watching it less than twelve hours ago. You get to a point where he is very sick of the jungle, and he's explaining that birds don't sing; they scream in agony. <laughs> <laughs> but it's this incredible cacophony sometimes of just noise and the, the, they could like sit there and dissect that 
you know, it's this bug, it's this, it's this, it's this, there's that bird, there's that bird, there's that bird. That was impressive. Hunting, with, being able to hunt with bows and arrows made entirely from native materials except for a piece of wire cut from a fence that was then hammered into the shape of a projectile point. Finding a plant called arrow plant, which you get your arrows, shooting a black curacao to get his feathers for fletching, taking a yucca type plant and pulverizing it, braiding it into a string, waxing that string with rubber from a rubber plant, lashing the fletching onto the shaft, making a glue from native materials with which to put the things together, cutting a tree, making a bow string, and then wading out into a river and seeing a fish that I can't see and shooting it with an arrow. It's good stuff. <laughs> yeah, that does sound It's amazing. good stuff, man. <laughs> and you're also watching it. You're watching things change. A thing I come back to again and again about that is that there's an individual I love quite a bit down there who he was explaining to me one time about the white-lipped peccaries, that they haven't been seeing a lot of white-lipped peccaries. And there's a fear in his village that the shaman from a neighboring village has grown jealous of his village. So this neighboring shaman is mad at my friend's village because they're so prosperous. And, and he a peccary has, is like a pig, a pig, yeah. a pig-like yes. animal. Yep, it's a, it's a, yeah. It would at a passing glance, a javelina is a collared peccary. People in the Southwest, like in Arizona and Western Texas, are familiar with javelinas. Um, yeah, that, that's a collared peccary. Then there's a, a slightly bigger, more gregarious version called a white lip peccary. And he said that these, he was concerned that this shaman in a neighboring village had grown jealous of his village and had locked up all of their peccaries in a mountain. And they had their own shaman trying to, to develop the necessary skill set to release their herd, their peccaries from that mountain. And I'll point out that you can email this individual if you have a problem with what he's saying. So they are at a real crossroads. Uh, yeah. And, yeah. And, to, and it's been a long crossroads, but to intersect, to intersect them at this place at this moment was fascinating. Yeah. What a time to capture the experience on film. Mm -hmm. And I'll, uh, I'll get the specific episode information from you afterwards and we can put those in the show notes as well. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah. Well, last question for, for this conversation, actually maybe second to last it, for people who want to reconnect, attempt to reconnect with nature, whether by themselves or with their families. I've also spent quite a bit of time in South America and other jungle based communities. And you, you do see this, what they sort of take for granted. It's almost, you mentioned David Foster Wallace. It's like the old fish that swims by the two young fish and says, how's the water boys? And they kind of nod and go by and they go, what's water, right? So to them, <laughs> them referring to the communities in places like you mentioned, the idea of being separated from nature is just inconceivable. Yeah, they wouldn't, just, they wouldn't describe that problem. Yeah, it's just the problem itself would be hard to explain. So for people who are listening to this and want to reconnect, feel engagement, kinship with nature, what would you suggest? It's interesting you ask because we're working on a book right now about kids, kids in nature, kids and nature, but you could also say kids in nature. And I've been thinking about this a fair bit because there's a, there's a risk of making, we're talking about these extreme forms of nature, right? The jungles of South America. Arctic, Alaska, we're talking about these extremes and you can create this problem where people think that engagement with nature needs to be a radical version. I think that as I've pondered this a lot lately, I think that there's some things that, that I find myself trying to do with my kids that aren't for kids only. And I think you need to start trying to develop the mindset of what it is to be like native. And I'm not trying to take away, I don't, I don't mean native in terms of that you'd be Native American, say, or Native Alaskan or Amerindian. I don't mean that. I mean, Native like the, the, of trying to belong to the, a place. We associate ourselves belonging to a fan base, belonging to a social media community, belonging to a municipality, belonging to a political persuasion. But if you want to start thinking about yourself as belonging to nature, start a list of all of the First, define what your yard is. It could be the grounds on an apartment building where you live. It could be your yard, whatever it is. 
Start a list of every bird. Get a good bird book. Get the Sibley, get Sibley's Guide to Birds of North America if you live in North America. How do you spell Sibley? Sibley. I believe he's Sibley. Yeah, he's an he's a illustrator and ornithologist. S-I-B-L-E-Y. I believe. Got it. All right. Get that book and start a list of every bird that you see from your property, from your place where you live, from your balcony or whatever it is, a list of everything you see and be, and allow yourself to count things that you see way off. So if you're in an apartment in New York and you can see out over the Hudson and you catch a seagull, count that and allow yourself to count every bird that you hear. And then do a couple other things. Uh, Acknowledge the solstices and the, the equinoxes. On those days, acknowledge what is happening. That today, the day is as long as the night. Or today is the longest day. The sun will shine for the longest time tonight. Or this will be the shortest day. The sun will shine the shortest amount today. And tomorrow, the sun will start marching back in another direction. Ask yourself, when you turn on your faucet and water comes out, where did that water come from? Did it fall as snow, rain? Where was it collected? Is it from an aquifer? What feeds the aquifer? And then ask yourself, when it goes down the drain, what is its path to where it hits the ocean? And make a mental map of, if you were to take a piss in your yard, make a mental map, it would flow into this ditch, and that ditch flows into that stream, and that stream flows into that river, and that river flows into that estuary, and that estuary drains into that part of the ocean. And make a mental map and look at that map. These are some of the things you can do sitting in your, at your desk. And I think that as you do these things and think about them, you'll start to realize that you're a participant in something. And you'll start to realize that there are things that are extremely reliable. The solstices, like the solstice, the equinox, there's things that are so unbelievably reliable. And there's things that are so chaotic, like you're passing the coming and going of birds. As you do those things, you'll find yourself feeling a part of something that's way cooler outside of being a part of your community and family, that's way cooler than being part of a fan base or part of a social media network. Do that and then go down to South America. (laughs) But start start at home, man. Like you're never going to understand it if you can't like just understand like where you're sitting and how it fits. Like get some awareness. You're like, you're in nature, man. You're in nature. It's just we're, we're, we're trained to not notice it. You know, it makes me think of the thousands of tussocks that I walked over, never actually getting down on my stomach and looking at one. Yeah, plant your face <laughs> in one of those things. Yeah, like like Barry Lo- like Barry Lopez describes. <laughs> those are great recommendations. Uh, I think I will actually look at the water investigation later this afternoon. It's fascinating. Yeah, I haven't gone so far as to make my kids memorize it, but I, I try to talk about it a lot. Well, Steve, we're going to hopefully do a round two of this. That's the plan. I would love to. Yeah. And is there anything else that you would like to mention? Any closing comments, any asks or requests of the audience? Of course, people can find a lot of what you do at themeateater.com. And we'll include all the social at Meat Eater, at Stephen Rinella on Instagram, at Stephen Rinella Meat Eater on Facebook. Is there anything else you'd like to say before no, if we... No, I could be so... Yeah, if, I, if, you, if you allow it, and I could be so uh, audacious as to, yeah, just ask people to go to TheMeatEater.com. You'll find not only stuff from me and about books I've done, but from you know all of my great colleagues and uh, our podcast network and daily stream of written material and other things. So yeah, please go there and check it out. And for everyone listening, as mentioned, I'll also include links in the show notes, which you can find at tim.blog forward slash podcast to the website, meaning Stephen's website, the podcast, specific episodes of the TV show, books, and many other things that have been mentioned in this conversation. So people can find those as well in one place. And Steve, what a pleasure to catch up. It's been a little while. <laughs> yeah, thanks for taking the time, man. It was fun to talk to you, as usual. You do a great job. Thanks, man. And we'll uh, we'll figure out scheduling for a round two very soon. And to everybody tuning in, until next time, thanks so much for listening. 
Hey guys, this is Tim again. Just a few more things before you take off. Number one, this is Five Bullet Friday. Do you want to get a short email from me? And would you enjoy getting a short email from me every Friday that provides a little morsel of fun before the weekend? And Five Bullet Friday is a very short email where I share the coolest things I've found or that I've been pondering over the week. That could include favorite new albums that I've discovered. It could include gizmos and gadgets and all sorts of weird shit that I've somehow dug up in the uh, the world of the esoteric as I do. It could include favorite articles that I've read and that I've shared with my close friends, for instance. And it's very short. It's just a little tiny bite of goodness before you head off for the weekend. So if you want to receive that, check it out. Just go to fourhourworkweek.com. That's fourhourworkweek.com, all spelled out, and just drop in your email, and you will get the very next one. And if you sign up, I hope you enjoy it. This episode is brought to you by All Form. If you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you've probably heard me talk about Helix Sleep and their mattresses, which I've been using since 2017. I have two of them upstairs from where I'm sitting at this moment. And now Helix has gone beyond the bedroom and started making sofas. They just launched a new company called Allform, A-L-L-F-O-R-M, and they're making premium, customizable sofas and chairs shipped right to your door at a fraction of the cost of traditional stores. So I'm sitting in my living room right now, and it's entirely Allform furniture. I've got two chairs, I've got an ottoman, and I have an L-sectional couch. And I'll come back to that. You can pick your fabric. They're all spill, stain, and scratch resistant. The sofa color, the color of the legs, the sofa size, the shape to make sure it's perfect for you in your home. Also, all form arrives in just three to seven days and you can assemble it all yourself in a few minutes. No tools needed. I was quite astonished by how modular and easy these things fit together, kind of like Lego pieces. They've got armchairs, love seats, all the way up to an eight seat sectional. So there's something for everyone. You can also start small and kind of build on top of it if you wanted to get a smaller couch and then build out on it, which is actually in a way what I did because I can turn my L sectional couch into a normal straight couch and then with a separate ottoman in a matter of about 60 seconds. It's pretty rad. So I mentioned I have all of these different things in this room. I use the natural leg finish, which is their lightest color, and I dig it. I mean, I've been using these things hours and hours and hours every single day. So I am using what I am sharing with you guys. And if getting a sofa without trying it in-store sounds risky, you don't need to worry. All form sofas are delivered directly to your home with fast free shipping, and you get 100 days to decide if you want to keep it. That's more than three months, and if you don't love it, they'll pick it up for free and give you a full refund. Your sofa frame also has a forever warranty that's literally forever. So check it out. Take a look. They've got all sorts of cool stuff to choose from. I was skeptical and it actually worked. It worked much better than I could have imagined and I'm very, very happy. So to find your perfect sofa, check out allform.com slash Tim. That's A-L-L-F-O-R-M dot com slash Tim. Allform is offering 20% off all orders to you, my dear listeners, at allform.com slash Tim. Make sure to use the code Tim at checkout. That's allform.com slash Tim and use code Tim at checkout. This episode is brought to you by FreshBooks. Thousands of listeners and a lot of the contractors I use and my readers use FreshBooks. If you've been thinking about turning your part-time side business into a full-time small business, or big business for that matter, you may be feeling some extra uncertainty these days, and that's obviously completely natural. There are a lot of questions that can come up. How do you create a professional appearance and experience? Who can help you with support? How do you manage the billing and all of that, but still focus on the primary work of your business and on growing your business. FreshBooks is an all-in-one invoicing and accounting solution, it does a lot more than that, that helps you take your business from part-time to full-time and it only takes minutes to set up. They have one of the best sign-up flows in the business. I've seen very few better. They have been helping people turn their passions into small businesses for 15 years and they can help you too. I've met the founders, I've looked at this product very closely. With automated invoicing, billable time, and expense tracking, and an intuitive dashboard that ties it all together, it's like having a full-time financial assistant with you every step of the way. You can create, customize, and send branded and professional-looking invoices in about 30 seconds. You get paid up to twice as fast with fees as low as 1% using ACH payments on FreshBooks. It's a fast, easy, and secure way for clients to pay you for your work and pay you more quickly. One of the many things that sets FreshBooks apart is their award-winning Toronto-based customer service. A real person picks up fast and will help you until you are completely satisfied and have your questions answered. 
There's a lot of uncertainty in the world right now, but your ability to build a business that you're passionate about, that you're proud of, doesn't have to be one of those things. Business owners all over the world rate FreshBooks as the easiest accounting software to use. Try it out. Check it out for free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash Tim. Just enter Tim Ferriss in the how did you hear about us section. Again, that's freshbooks.com slash Tim to check it out and try it for free for 30 days. One more time, freshbooks.com slash Tim.